Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the online edition of the Sustainable Fest 2021 by Jurong Lake Gardens. And thank you for joining us at the NPOX Bus Facebook page. I'm Chris Kai, your host for today. We have an exciting lineup for you, starting with a talk by our gardening expert, Dr. Wilson Wong, a sharing on composting by our allotment gardeners, and a series of virtual tours around Jurong Lake Gardens and showcasing the biodiversity here. We will also like to have you and your friends join us if they're interested in this program. Share this link and ask them to tune in too. Now, let us take you on a virtual tour of Jurong Lake Gardens with Kartini, Group Director of Jurong Lake Gardens. She will give you a quick peek at the many features and attractions in the gardens, many of which were created with sustainability in mind. Hi, I'm Tatini and welcome to Jurong Lake Gardens. Spanning 90 hectares over three segments, Jurong Lake Gardens is the first national garden to be situated in the heartlands of Singapore. The gardens were specially designed to recreate natural landscapes as well as restore the area's natural ecosystems. The beautiful grasslands here is home to migratory and resident birds like the scaly-breasted munia and the rare-zitting cysticola. This is where bird watchers can enjoy wildlife in a non-intrusive way. Connected to the grasslands is a walk that winds through a restored freshwater swamp forest where plants were carefully chosen to thrive in the riparian zone. Niram Streams is a series of braided, naturalised waterways running through the gardens into Jurong Lake. It would be hard to believe that this was once a 300-metre-long, straight, concrete drain. The drain was converted into naturalised streams to channel rainwater into the lake. Plants growing in the streams help cleanse the water. The plants are looking good. Play spaces were also created to nestle within nature. This playground was inspired by animals living in freshwater swamp forests, so kids can learn about these animals through play. The interesting thing about Clusia Cove is that it runs on a closed-loop water circulation system. Water from Jurong Lake is cleansed by a natural biotope, filtered and UV-treated before it flows into the play pools and then recirculated to be cleansed again thus creating a self-sustaining water system for a fun experience for visitors. What makes this garden really special is that it embraces smart technologies that help staff to manage the gardens more efficiently. Come on in. The garden has brought nature closer to home and embodies Singapore's vision of a city in nature. Thank you for joining me on this tour of Jurong Lake Gardens. Take care and see you. Welcome back to the Sustainable Fest 2021. That was a quick tour of the Lakeside Garden at Jurong Lake Gardens. Let's dive right into the rest of the program. First up, we have our gardening expert, Dr. Wilson Wong, who will be sharing about identifying common plant pests, as well as some environmentally friendly and sustainable methods that you can use to manage these pests. There will also be a short Q&A session at the end, so if you have any questions, ask away toward the end at the comments section. Over to you, Dr. Wilson. Hey, hello. Good morning, everybody. I'm Wilson. Today, I'm going to share with you how you can deal with pet garden pests sustainably. All right? So let's take a look, first off, by looking at some of the common pests that you encounter in your home garden. Wow, do they look scary to you? These are what I call small sucking or rasping pests. All right? They are not very big in size uh, because uh, they, and they like to hide and it's not easy to see them. So what are they, the common ones? All right? You have your aphids, you have your midi bugs, right? and you have your spider mites. Okay? 
all of them suck sap from your plant and cause their leaves to become distorted. And you have trips. Okay? If you grow roses, you grow lotus at home, you have trips that will visit your plant and they scrape the leaf tissue and that, that is what we call rasping. Okay? So they are called rasping pests. Next, let's take a look at another range of pests. These are the bigger ones. You have snails, you have grasshoppers, you have caterpillars, and you have beetles, all right? Snails will wraps, okay? The rest will chew. And all of them, what do they do? They make very big holes on your plant leaves, make them look very ugly, okay? And they are very big, okay? So remember the sizes because we're going to talk about it in a minute and I'll relate their size to how you can deal with them, okay? So these are very common pests, right? But the thing about it is that you will want to get rid of them. In nature, they are predators, they will eat them. So they always like to hide. So how do you, you know, notice their presence? It's through the damage that they inflict on your plants. Let's take a look at, at an example. There you go. On the top left picture, you have a typical tapioca leaf, all right, or cassava leaf. Look closely, all right, in this, into the screen, you can see that there are small white uh, yellow dots or speckles all right, on the leaves. All right? So you flip the leaf onto, onto the underside, on the bottom left picture, you can see that you see some more speckling, but if you look closely, you have small little red dots. Those are spider mites. You can miss, your eye very, you can miss it very easily with your naked eye. So it's good to invest in a hand lens. And then you look closely, ah, they are all there. They are underneath the leaves. They, they will hide from you and their predators and they prevent the rain from washing them away. Smart, right? But that's survival for you. So once you understand that, you will know how to deal with them. Okay, let me just introduce to you now into the talk proper. Integrated pest management. That is a sustainable way that you can use to deal with pest issues in the garden. Let's take a look. There you go. IPM for short, Integrated Pest Management. The bottom part of the triangle or the pyramid, okay, as, as some people will call it, is through prevention. It's a day-to-day -day, um, approach that you can use. Next, you move up to mechanical, physical, biological, biorational pesticides, and finally, conventional pesticides. For most of us, we we'll only use the bottom four approaches, and we use it in tandem, all together. It's not exactly a stepwise approach, but we do it all together. And remember, at the bottom of the pyramid, you do prevention on the day-to-day -day basis. But as you go higher and higher, means that you need to be active. It's active management. And as you can see on the, in the middle, toxicity. As you move up the, the pyramid, you'll get more toxic. Okay? So conventional pesticides are at the very top, or what we call chemical pesticides, something that we do not want to use. Often, it's, it's the last resort because it harms the environment and it's not very good for us as well. Okay? So now, let's take a look at another aspect of um, you know, IPM itself, all right? So you have crop rotation. For those of you who grow edibles at home, I'm pretty sure this is something that you, know, you will be very aware of. We try to rotate the crops, try to grow different plants uh, in the botanical aspect or a, pro a horticultural aspect is that we try to grow plants from different families. Okay, we don't want to grow the same crop over and over again because it's like, you know, Say, for example, you grow chai sim and chai sim tastes good and you have a certain pest that likes to go for it. They don't keep going to it. It's like all of us like to go and queue up in the hawker centre eating the same nice food again and again. So we try to change the things around so that the pest will not stay there for too long. And of course, for prevention, it's good for you to look at your plants every day. You know, some people say they like to talk to their plants, right? So as you talk to your plants, look under the side of the leaves, you know, look in between the plants, see whether if there's any pests. Okay? and look for damage on the, on the plant leaves so that you can actually nip the problem in the bud. Prevention is better than cure, all right? And next, it's good to grow your plant in the in their best, um, I mean, optimal growing conditions where they can perform the best, all right? So like, for example, over here, my range of plants, I have my crotillaria or the rattle bean, I have my long bean, I have my marigold. You know, all these plants are sun-loving plants. So you grow them under direct sunlight for four to six hours or more if you, can, if you have, and they'll be very happy. Happy plants, healthy plants will have less pests. And more importantly is that you need to ensure your soil has good soil health. 
Okay, it's important to put in good quality compost. Later on, we have a composting talk. You know, you can tune in to talk about, to listen how you can make good compost, all right? And then compost, organic matter is important for microbes in the soil. It makes the soil healthy so that it suppresses soil-borne diseases, okay? All right, so that's very important. So let's move on to the next approach, okay? Let's take a look. Ah, if you go to our allotment gardeners, uh, gardens, I'm sure you see this all the time. Protected cultivation, people put up nets, right? And then they bag their fruits. So this is to prevent the entry of large pests, right? You can see that the big net that I have over there prevents snails from going to my leafy vegetables. And I don't need to use any pesticides. I won't get, you know, caterpillar attacks as well. So that's one way where you can don't need to use pesticides at all, all right? So that is an example of physical and mechanical approach in IPM itself. Now let's move on to what we call biological approach, right? So what is biological approach? Important. If you come to our parks and gardens, I'm pretty sure you see we don't grow a single plant everywhere, you know? So that what we're trying to do, avoid monoculture, okay? So you can see that on my table, I prepared a range of plants, all right? So this is the rattle bean, or we call it Crotalaria retusa. It's a very interesting plant for those of you who have children at home or in, uh, in the school because the seed pods, when you shake it, when it's dry, it's like a rattle. But what's important about this rattle bean is that the roots, okay, will prevent nematodes from coming to your garden, all right? There is, it, they release chemicals that will deter nematodes or kill them. And of course, the very well-known one is your marigold, right? Pretty flowers and is nematocidal. So for those of you who grow plants at home, right, be it in your flower pot or is it in your community garden or any garden out there, I'm sure those of you who grow tomatoes, melons, bananas, okay, a lot of you always tell me you got root, root not nematode issue where the roots swell up and you know nematicides are very toxic. So one way is to, when you finish this crop, grow these nematocidal plants like your crotolaria, marigold, Okay, for, for several months, and that is a way to get rid of nematodes from your garden soil and can do it for potted plants as well. Okay? And long beans, right? Very, very pretty long beans here. I got the, uh, I got the spotted one, right? not common. But you can grow this if you have the space in your community garden at the periphery. Why? Long beans attract what? Aphids, right? A lot of you will grow them, but you'll notice the aphids don't really damage the plant. But when you have aphids, who will come? Ladybugs. So this is the way for you to attract ladybugs to your garden. So you grow the plants that are susceptible on one side. Okay, let the good guys come. And after that, the good guys will also go to your rest of your plants to help you do pest control. So avoid monoculture. Grow a diversity of plants. You grow you know, uh, plants that will secrete chemicals that will deter pests, as well as attract your friends to your garden. So that's the biological approach. Now, we are going up to the uh, top to the, of the pyramid already, which is your bio-rational um, chemicals, right? So, or methods, right? So they include what, we, what you, you are always familiar with, most of you are familiar with, will be your neem oil, your summer oil, and then your insecticidal soap. Some of you will also use microbial pesticides. So these approaches, they are less toxic, and it's something that we want to use in the garden because they will not harm your, your good friends, you know, the, the beneficial um, fauna in your garden. They'll do the pest control for you. So unlike your chemical pesticide, they will, you know, kill anything, everything. So it's good for you to use such low toxicity pesticides in your garden. And like, for example, your common um, bio-rational pesticides like neem oil, summer oil and neem oil, I mean, um, and insecticide soap, they act by suffocating the pest and they work on the small sucking and rasping pest that we talked about earlier. Your aphids, your mini bugs, and your trips. Okay? So the large ones, you use a netting to deter them. And for the smaller guys, we can actually use the bio-rational pesticides like neem oil, summer oil, and insecticidal soap to deal with them. And remember that you need to learn to spray these bio pesticides, uh, bio-rational pesticides properly in the proper manner, in the correct manner, so that they are effective. And I'm going to show you how to do so. Because you know why? When I share the, these measures, a lot of people tell me, hey, Wilson, it's not effective one, lay, you know? So I'm going to tell you how to do so, all right? 
it is important for you to be protected. Okay, personal protective equipment, PPE for short. First, you need to get a pair of gloves. I would prefer to use the chemical resistant one. You can get this, you know, from supermarkets. My mom used it for laundry. Next, now everybody has a mask at home. You need a mask. And of course, you can get a face, uh, face shield as well. I, I believe this, all this equipment over here is quite self-explanatory. Basically, it's to prevent you from getting into contact with it, breathing it in, and getting it onto your skin and the, your eyes. Okay? So for some of you who are, if you are afraid of, maybe you can get, well, uh, an, a, plus, uh, a plastic apron to cover yourself. Okay? Try to use things that you can reuse and not one-time usage. You see, I use uh, these gloves instead of the latex gloves. Okay? I can reuse it again. So get yourself protected. Right? And for those of you, I just want to give you an example. Imagine you're spraying chili water. You know, the bird chili water is so hot. So if you don't get yourself protected and when you spray, and when there's a breeze, what's going to happen? It's going to get into your eyes. It's going to get to your skin. You're going to burn your eyes and skin. So that's a very good example. Even though it is a food-grade substance, very safe, but it will still hurt you. All right? Okay. Now, let me just take another example. Uh, give you another example. This is a badly infested twig, okay, uh, that I took from the garden. This is your Okinawan spinach, you can see. Very scary, right? Everybody said, well, listen, this is the first time you, you do talk and you show scary things. No choice, ah. Pest talk is like that, okay? So this um, tweak has a lot of mealy bugs on it. It's a sub-sucking, uh, it's a sap-sucking pest. So they like to congregate around the young leaves because it's easy to pierce, right, and suck sap from it. So, and wh when they're doing that, the developing leaves will crinkle, as you can see over here. And what happens? They all hide inside. Look. All right. Wow, scary, right? And they hide beneath. So you can see this is a survival instinct. It prevents you from seeing them. It prevents you from getting your pesticide onto them. All right. So what must you do? So I will tell you, get a pair of secateurs when you have issues like that. Right? It's good to trim away heavily infested portions. Wow, very scary, right? All right, so cut it away. Then you can, it's easier for you to spray and you have less pests to deal with and you don't use as much pesticide and you don't contaminate the environment, okay? And let, after that, when you deal with this, the plant will regrow, okay? So, besides using bio-rational pesticides, actually, to be frank, there's something that you can use every day. You know, it's what? Water. Okay, water is non-toxic, okay? Uh, for today's demonstration, I have water here, okay? And, I can, and, and a lot of you like to mix your plants, right? So by the, the act of really misting your plants is actually a good thing to do. You know why? You're washing away pests, their eggs, and cleaning your plant at the same time, all right? So when you are spraying your plant, remember, okay? Put on all these things first, okay? Before you spray. And then when you spray your plants, if you are wearing gloves, okay? What is good about it is that you don't have to be afraid that, you know, the pesticide getting onto your hands and your skin. So when you have your gloves on, you can actually flip the leaves up and you can easily use a sprayer to spray the pesticides on your plant. Rather than, you know, doing this, going at awkward angles and all that. Okay, so that makes pesticide application a lot easier. Okay, so I hope this sharing so far is useful and it's made simple and easy to apply at home. So I will now go into the Q&A section. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have questions for me, and you can type it into the comments section. Now, be, while all of you are doing that, let me answer two very common questions that I get all the time. The first question is, is it safe to use normal hand soap on my plants? Answer is yes and no. Why? Because normal hand soap, depending on the type that you like to use, because you know some of them say it's very good at removing grease from your hands, remember that the plant leaves also have a waxy layer that protects it. So if you use something that's too strong and you spray, what's going to happen? It's going to dissolve away that waxy layer and burn your plants. And it's not uncommon. People tell me, hey, Wilson, you tell me use soap after my plant turned black. Yeah, the pest didn't die, but your plant died. Okay? So it's important to get the dose right. 
And also another thing, if you can, try to use food-grade materials. Food-grade means safe to eat. Okay, so that especially if you're eating, I mean, you're going to eat the plant that you grow. So it's good to use fruit grade materials. And more importantly is that if you're buying commercial bio-rational pesticides or even chemical pesticides, please look at the label. Get it from a reputable source. Okay, and make sure that they say that it is suitable for edible plants, especially if you're going to use it on your vegetables. And there's something what we call Withholding period means what? If you follow the dosage and you spray into your plants, how long you have to wait after that, then you can harvest and that is safe to eat. So that's very important, okay? Reputable sources and it's food safe and then it is indicated for edible plants. Please remember that. The next question is this. Just now you all heard the thunder, right? I thought I said the wrong thing, okay? So Jurong is raining now. So I just sprayed pesticide, the second question, but it rained heavily afterwards. Do I need to apply again? Well, it depends on the type of pesticide that you are using and how soon after you apply and it rain. Okay? So for most bio-rational pesticides, they are contact. So what does it mean? It means that when you spray onto your plant, it stays on the surface. So when the rain comes, you'll wash everything away, right? So you have to apply again. So the answer to this is that you need to apply again. But if you're using chemical pesticides that they say they are systemic, which you drench or you spray onto the leaves, usually, if the rain comes after the, plant, the pesticide has dried up, it's fine. You don't need to spray again. But if it rains shortly after that, you probably have to apply. So you know what you need to do? Look at the weather forecast. Lah, okay? You can actually look at the phone apps these days where the clouds are coming. Like for example, just now I saw the clouds coming. I'm not going to spray. I'm not going to waste money and I don't want to contaminate the environment. Okay? So I hope these two questions, you know, answer some of your queries that you may have. Let me now tackle your questions. Okay, Priscilla has this question for me. She said, um, Neem oil doesn't work on my plants. Okay, the question I have for you is that, what kind of, um, what pests are you dealing with? Right? So make sure you use the right kind of Pesticide on the right kind of pest. So I assume that you are spraying small little guys like your white flies, you know, uh, your spider mites and your aphids. Okay? So it's important for you first, number one, like what I said just now, to emphasize this. Make sure you spray every part of the plant, okay? Because they like to hide and sometimes you missed it. You missed it means they stay alive. Okay, so that's one. Second thing, Make sure you repeatedly spray. If it's a very bad infestation, probably every three days, make sure you do that so that you kill everything. But let me just share with you, it is not realistic to expect zero pests on your plants. Okay? Nature is very hard to get rid of. Life is very, very, very strong. Right? So what we are trying to do with all these pesticides is that we try to bring down the pest levels to a manageable level such that they do not damage our plants. Okay, so this is something I must tell you, all right, because it is not realistic to say my plants are 100% pest free. Okay, next question. Let's see. All right, how do I get rid of um, fungus rust on my fig leaves uh, by Jade? So this Disease, it's actually a fungal disease, it's actually very, very common on figs, especially if you grow them outdoors, not protected from the rain. So, one way to reduce the incidence of the disease is to grow them under a shelter, right? So, you give it a clear shelter where the sun comes through, but prevents rain from getting on the leaves. So, that's, that's the first method, which is, there's now IPM, I said, uh, physical mechanical method, right? So, but if you want an added measure, you can go to the nurseries and buy what we call copper fungicide. Okay, it is a fungi, it's a bioreactional fungicide made from a copper compound. Okay, usually they call that call it copper soap, and that works pretty well for rust. Okay, let's then go on to the next question. Okay, Jess has this question. How do I prevent butterflies and moths from laying eggs on my plants? Okay, just to quote the example, uh, my, my talk again, 
cover your plants with a fine netting, all right? And you should use the white color netting if you notice the picture I showed earlier because it allows light to go through. Because if you buy plastic netting, uh, you go to the nurseries, it's very easy to find the black netting, which we call shade netting, and you have the green netting, okay? All these will cut out some light. So it's good to use the white colored one because it allows a lot of light to go through so your plants can still photosynthesize. But yet at the same time, it denies the butterflies and your moths from laying eggs onto your plants. But you know, at the end of the day, they also your friends, you know, they actually pollinate your flowers. Ah, don't be so selfish, they can. Give a little bit to the nature to eat so that they can pollinate your flowers. Lah. Give and take, okay, people? Okay, next question. I lecture too much. Ah. Okay, what is the effective method to get rid of scales for adeniums? Uh, Yasmin asked this question, all right? So, scales is a sap-sucking insect, right? So, you of course can use the um, neem oil, summer oil, which will cover the insect and suffocate them. But of course, if, you, if it's not too serious, what you can actually do is to use a soft toothbrush and remove them first, and then you spray. Okay, that will reduce the amount of pests to deal with, all right? So that's a, a, a suggestion I have for you, and repeat spraying so that you get rid of as much as of the scale insect as you can from your adenium. Okay, let's see, uh, why a lot of questions, fast and furious. I hope I can answer everything. Okay, Christopher has this question for me. Is it good to, is, what, would you recommend the use of diatomaceous earth for edible plants? So diatomaceous earth basically is a white color powder uh, derived from the atoms that is mined. So what happens is that it is believed that uh, it can cut the exoskeleton of certain pests and kill them. Lah. But the thing about it is that you need to understand how diatomaceous earth works. It works best when it's dry. When it's dry. Okay, so a lot of people apply it onto the soil and then they water. So, nah, nah. So it may not work so well for your root mealy bugs and your soil mealy bugs, but it works better if you are going to put it onto the leaves so that you can get rid of aphids uh, and so on, right? Spider mites and all that. But one thing about it, some people don't like to use diatomaceous earth on their plants. You know why? It looks like as if like, it just snowed in Singapore. Your plants all look white in color. So the aesthetic value, not there lah. Okay, so this is not something that you need to think about. Okay, next questions. Wow, a lot of questions left. <laughs> okay, give me a minute, okay? I need to choose those that I didn't talk about just now, all right? Okay, I have this question. Betty asks, does garlic deter pests? Yes, to a certain extent, all right? But uh, you need to make sure that you use it on the right kind of plants. Ah. But if you grow garlic, I mean, Chinese chives, garlic chives, and onion and all that, then you spray this onto the, same the plant from the same family, probably it's not going to work. But it works as a deterrent, okay, for certain pests that don't like the smell. But um, I would, from personal experience, limited efficacy, okay? Okay, Margaret has this question for me. All right, how do I treat uh, black roots of your phytonias? Okay, so um, this, is not uh, this is not really pest, pest as in what insects and mites, but it's more of a disease. So my, que my question to you is that, do you overwater your plants? Okay, many a times when you buy phytonia in a pot from the nursery, it's potted in coconut peat or peat. It's very wet. It retains a lot of moisture. So what happens is that a lot of our, uh, a lot of us gardeners love our plants to death. You know, then we water and water and water and water. So <laughs> what happens? It's too wet. The roots rot. Then the stem rot lah. Then the plant will have whatever that you 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 mentioned. So it's important for you then to watch your watering according to I mean. Look at the environment. If it's very not very hot, right? Don't water so much. Let it dry a little bit, then water again. Okay. So this is about understanding growing conditions, water needs, 
and how that condition, if it's not ideal, will lead to plant diseases and pest issues. Okay, let's move on. Today, I have a lot of questions for all of you. I mean, a lot of time for you to ask questions. So, why wow, you see the questions so many? I see really, I'm so scared. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Wait, uh, hold on. Uh. Okay, Suan Ching asked this question. How many marigolds do I need to plant in the plot? I would say that if you, if you want to put marigolds into the plot to get rid of nematodes, if you can afford it, clear the whole plot and plant nothing but marigolds. <laughs> okay? Uh, that is a good way. One or two uh, may not work so well. All right? Okay. Gyok Chu has this question for me. Bioinsecticide for small flying flies on chili plants. Hold on, uh, maybe it didn't send. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it appears on the screen. So you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so the small flying pest uh, is what? You know, when you ask this kind of question, I need to imagine a little bit. Okay, I believe it is white flies. Okay? White flies is a very common pest in chilies. So um, you can use soap solution, you can use neem oil, and you can also use summer oil. But of course, um, you can also use another um, bio-rational pesticide called matrin, M-A-T-R-I-N-E. It's, de it's being derived from a Chinese medicinal herb, which you can buy from online shopping platforms, okay? which is pretty convenient these days. So, so remember, you need to rotate. Don't keep using the same thing again and again, okay? because the pest will become resistant over time, and that's not what we want. Okay? Hmm, hold on. Uh, let me just see if there's any questions. All right, Shirley has this question for me. Uh, can I use a raw, raw egg? Uh, probably put it under the soil as a fertilizer. Uh, not something that I will recommend because you know why? You will attract critters to your garden, uh, right? Maybe you get rats, you get a cat or a dog who likes to eat all these things to come and, you know, dig your soil and damage your plants. So, not something that I would encourage. So, we tend to avoid adding animal products to the garden, okay, because it can lead to a lot of issues, okay? That applies to composting as well, okay? So, don't go and bury animal dung and all that into your garden because you don't want food safety issues. Okay, so let's see. Um... Okay, um, I have this question here. How do I deal with... Um, In Hong has this question for me. He said, how do I get a broad mice effectively? Broad mice, you can use... A pest they hate sulfur, all right? Uh, that doesn't mean you go to the nursery and buy a, a sulfur powder and throw it onto your plants, okay? So what you can use is uh, what we call lime sulfur, which is a compound made from sulfur and lime itself, um, and then you spray onto your plants. So that's one way. And of course, you can use sulfur soap, Okay, which I have mentioned, uh, which I shared with you guys, uh, I mean, on various platforms and on my previous uh, talks as well. But very, very important here is this: um, make sure that before you eat anything that uh, that you harvest from the garden, especially after you spray your pesticide, make sure you wash thoroughly, then to make sure it's food safe, lah. Okay. Um, because now everybody likes to grow edibles. You notice I keep saying food safe, food safety. Okay, that is important because it's for you and my health. Okay, so let's see. I think there's a lot of questions. Um, let's see. Okay, Doreen has this question for me. It says that how do I prevent and detect uh, root nematodes? Okay, it's very difficult. Uh, some plants are, don't show any overt symptoms, but what happens is if you notice your plant doesn't seem to grow if you put fertilizers and all that, and despite all the things that you did, it's not growing. So what you need to do is that sometimes just to take out some soil and look at the roots. If you see that it becomes very knobbly and big and swollen, and not your usual fibrous roots, uh, then that is root node nematodes most likely. So of uh, you can Google up an uh, um, image and see how root node nematodes look like, but don't mix it with the root nodules of your bean plants, okay? Root nodules, N-O-D-U-L-E-S, okay? Because your bean plants have these uh, structures on the roots, they are easily confused with root node nematodes. Okay, it's coming to the end of my talk. I don't have, many t uh, don't have much time left, so probably I will tackle the last question for, for today.
Okay. Josephine, this question, do I throw fruit skin directly onto my soy? Answer is, please don't do it. Okay. Listen to our composting talk later. Use it for, as an ingredient, feedstock for your, comp uh, for your compost. The reason why you don't do this and throw all these things on top is because you will attract critters, then you may have fungal issues and all that that will affect your plant growth. It may or may not, it depends on what kind of plants you grow. So it's best to compost it separately, and once the compost is mature, bring it back into the garden. Okay, so I hope the sharing, sharing session today um, is useful. Okay, I hope that you learned something new. Now I'll hand over the time over to Chris. Once again, thank you, Dr. Wilson, for joining us today and for sharing that very insightful talk about plant pests. I'm sure many of us found the Q&A very helpful. And if you'd like to find more video resources on managing pest issues in your home gardens, such as how to make a simple DIY trap to control a fruit fly infestation, check out our Sustainable Fest 2021 playlist on the NPOC's SG YouTube page. Did you know that dragonflies and devilflies are good indicators of the health of a water body? They are also beneficial to us as they feed on insects such as mosquitoes and midges. Now, let's join Ruth from Jurong Lake Gardens for a tour around Neiram Streams, a series of naturalized streams that channel storm water from the surrounding estate into Jurong Lake. Find out how it has also been enhanced to encourage a greater diversity of dragonflies and damselflies. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth. Join me on a virtual tour of Niram Streams at Jurong Lake Gardens and find out more about the plants, dragonflies and damselflies here. Let's go! Niram Streams used to be a 300 meter long concrete drain leading from Yuanqing Road to Jurong Lake. It has since been transformed into a series of naturalized waterways spanning 1.3 kilometers in length and planted with a variety of riparian plant species. This naturalized waterway acts as a floodplain. This helps with climate resilience as it increases the capacity of the drainage system here and allows for more effective stormwater management. The plants along the stream banks also trap sediments and absorb nutrients before they enter Jurong Lake, one of Singapore's 17 reservoirs. These plants also provide shelter and a resting spot for our native fauna such as dragonflies and damselflies. Dragonflies and damselflies provide many ecosystem benefits, such as pest control. They feed on a wide range of insects, such as mosquitoes and midgets. The presence of dragonflies also indicate that the water is clean and the ecosystem is healthy. As part of the habitat enhancement, we've worked together with Tomasic Foundation in 2019 and we've created a dragonfly habitat at Niram Streams. This project aims to identify habitat factors that contributes to the dragonfly diversity, such as plant species and landscape. Around 30 different plant species have been planted here as part of the habitat enhancement efforts. These plants of varying heights can act as resting spaces for dragonflies and damselfly species to perch on and hiding spaces for their young to seek shelter from predators. Some of these plant species in Niram streams include the spiny lassia, a native plant species typically found in the freshwater swamp forests and river rind habitats. On my left, we have the pandan plant. The pandan plant should be familiar to most of you. Pandan grows best in moist soil and has fragrant leaves. The juice extracted from this pandan adds fragrance to tea and desserts. The dense growth of this semi-submerged plant makes good hiding spot for dragonfly nymphs. Next to the pandan, we have the alligator flag plant. You can identify them by their flowers suspended from a zigzag shaped flower stalk. This plant also makes a very good resting platform for dragonflies to bask under the sunlight. A number of dragonfly and damselfly species also call Niram streams their home. One way to tell them apart is to look at their body shape. Dragonflies have a thicker body compared to the damselflies. The common parasol is one of the most frequently spotted dragonflies in Niram streams. The male common parasol has a distinct brownish red body and wings. The common scarlet is another dragonfly species often seen in Jurong Lake Gardens. It is also one of the largest species among the red-coloured dragonflies. 
The males are red from head to tail and have a distinct dark line along the top of their abdomen. Females share the same distinct line but are yellow in colour. A damselfly species, often spotted at Niram streams, is the common blue tail. The males can be identified by their green thorax and blue abdomen tip. Since the enhancement planting in Niram streams, we have also recorded a few more species of dragonflies and damselflies that have returned, such as the common amber wing and the yellow barred flutterer. As the name suggests, the male common amber wing can be identified by its set of beautiful amber coloured wings. The yellow barred flutterer is unmistakable with its distinctive yellow dark brown barred pattern hind wings. As its name goes, it has a distinct fluttering flying pattern that is unlike any other dragonfly. Thank you for joining me on this tour of Niram Streams at Jurong Lake Gardens. We hope you enjoy exploring the diversity of the plants, dragonflies and damselflies here. See you again soon. Bye! Welcome back to Sustainable Fest 2021. It is fascinating to learn from nature and to apply this knowledge to create a feature that helps to manage increased stormwater runoff while providing ecosystem benefits to us and our native wildlife. Now, let us move on to our next segment. I'm sure many of you have heard about composting and some of you probably practice it at home. Today, we have with us Jeremy from Jurong Lake Gardens and together with Tui Fern from Foodscape Collective and Mr. Law, also affectionately known as LY, who is an allotment gardener and compost maker at Jurong Lake Gardens. Let's find out more from them. First question, Jeremy, I would really like to find out what is compost and what do we use it for? Yeah, so compost is actually decomposed organic material. And uh, to make compost, we use organic materials such as vegetable trimmings and fruit peels. And all these can help us to actually reduce food waste at home and yeah. also do our part for climate action. Oh, that is really, really awesome. So, can you please share with us as well, right, that I heard Jurong Lake Gardens has a community composting initiative. What is that? Okay, so this community composting initiative started because we actually wanted to promote sustainable gardening and we also wanted to foster a sense of kampong spirit among our allotment gardeners in Jurong Lake Gardens. Very nice. So, because of the COVID situation, we actually started off with a series of webinars uh, where our allotment gardeners and our volunteers can learn about uh, the basics of composting as well as also the different types of composting. Wow. So all these uh, webinars, uh, food scrapping session and composting session were all curated by the team from Project Black Go. And last November, when we were able to go on site, we, the team actually went down on site and did food scrapping. They brought food scraps from their homes, uh, from their neighbours, to, back to the Gottlottman Gardens to, to compost. And uh, later, LY will also share more about you know, their experience as well. Wow! So... There's really an entire kampong spirit that is coming in whereby we have many different households coming together to make Singapore more sustainable. Good on you guys. Now, I want to find out as well. We mentioned about Project Black Go. Tui Fen, what is Project Black Go? Right. Black Go is really compost. Um, it's really treasured by gardeners and farmers. Um, so Project Black Go is a community food scrap project by a Foodscape Collective, which is an ecosystem of people who really want to come together and co-create a fair, inclusive, regenerative food system for all. Mm. Um, so a few of us in this ecosystem, we are compost makers. We have been composting at home with our communities. And we really felt that what if we could really spread our knowledge to more neighbourhoods in Singapore and really start compost hubs all over. Yeah. So we pitched this idea to OCBC Cares and they funded us to get this project started. So we started going down to uh, selected neighbourhoods so that we work with people who are really interested um, teach them, guide them, um, journey with them to become co competent compost makers mm. and also people to become food scrappers so that those who cannot compost, make compost, they can contribute as well. 
Nice. So again, this whole kampong spirit, collective spirit, and also talking about that, right? Every time I hear the word Project Black Gold, I don't know about you guys and our audience back at home, but I always think of durian. But obviously, it's not durian. Maybe it's just the durian season. But Project Black Gold, obviously, the black gold is the compost itself, and it's definitely black gold for gardeners, yes. right, Paper, when you were mentioning. Now, can you share with us, how has the response been? It's been awesome. Like, it was really just a dream for us. And then for people to say, yes, this is a really wonderful project. And a lot of people were writing in to us to say, can you come to our neighborhood too? And we were telling them, you know, we really wanted to journey with selected neighborhoods. And it really takes like several months, um, dedicated time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's been really awesome. I think what was also really awesome is that the few of us who have been composting in Singapore, we brought our knowledge together collectively so that we could have a syllabus that we bring out to every neighborhood and say, you know, this is what works in Singapore. Um, so it's been really awesome. Um, and I think it's been awesome to be part of this journey with them here, right here in Zhuang Lake Gardens. Very nice. That is amazing. Now it's really cool to see how we're really turning food scraps into compost, making it more sustainable. And talking about that, LY, I would like to have you. And I want to ask and find out, you have actually been in the Zhuang Lake Gardens working on the hot compost pile. Yes. What motivated you to join? <coughs> I realised we have a lot of food waste when we're preparing the food at home. All right? By joining the compost team, we are able to reduce the amount of food waste. Then we can turn this food waste into compost and use it to enrich and condition our soil in the garden. Mm. To this, I will be able to know better the soil and how the compost can improve the soil. Wow. So, you've already <coughs> gone on from just drawing Lake Gardens, but you've already started it in your own home. Yes. I would like to find out, actually, are there any challenges you face because there is home, but there's no drawing Lake Gardens? What are the challenges you might have faced? Yes. It is not easy to start during this period of COVID-19. Yeah. Right? We managed to get the number of allotment gardeners and also the volunteer from Jurong Lake Gardens but most of us have no uh, new to the compost and no experience in terms of composting. Mm. So that will be difficulty that we have to overcome. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine not having the experience and also with COVID-19, I mean, that must have been very difficult. Mm. But so glad to hear that you've overcome <coughs> the challenges with having volunteers coming in as well. Now, talking about the composting, I'd like to find out, have you or the team, com or rather, harvested any of the compost? And if you have, how have you used them? We have harvested the first batch of compost in February. Ooh. And the second batch in May. Nice. And it's about 100 kg per batch. And we are sharing among all the volunteers, members, as well as the gardener. I'm using this to mix up with the soils to enrich and improve the condition of the soil. Mm, very this nice. will help the plant. Right. Here is a compo, is the moist, and also dark brown. So called, we say black gold. Black gold. <laughs> 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 You're right. right. So, with this, after we apply the so called the black gold to the plant, it grows much better and healthier. Nice. So I'm sure as well, after seeing all of this, our viewers at home might be a little bit interested to find out how you can start composting at home. So, Jeremy, LY, you have been with Drone Lake Gardens for a while. You have been doing a hot compost pile. Why don't you share with us how can we get started? Maybe some of the materials we can get started with. Certainly. So I think um, the recipe is actually very simple. Uh, what, what we really need is actually an equal volume of carbon-rich materials. So carbon-rich materials are your browns, or what we call browns, such as your dried leaves, uh, dried twigs, and sawdust that you see here. And also an equal volume of nitrogen-rich materials, such as uh, your vegetable trimmings, uh, fruit peels, or you know, if you are keeping foliage plant, your, your, when you prune the dried leaves or dying leaves, as well as flowers that you use for decoration mm. and for prayers as well. Mm. So maybe... Elwa, you want to share more about what's the process after that? We alternate the greens into the brown and make it in level and make it into a pile. Then we water the pile until it is nice and moist. Right. right. This 
will then the power will generate the heat by itself. Mm. Right. <laughs> Weekly, so, we come to toss it or we flip it over to induce the oxygen in. Right. To get it to decompose, right? Yes. Very nice. So with this alternating layers and stuff, okay, don't know, maybe I'm hungry in the morning or something, but it reminds me of something that Tui Fen mentioned. It feels a bit like kuei lapis, you know? But of course, with this wet, moist, we actually have it turned into compost, but not to forget that we have to aerate it by flipping it over from time to yes. time. Right? Very cool. So I also understand, right, that Tui Fen, you have a little bit of a tip as well on how we can actually get started at home. Yes. But maybe before I go there, yeah. there's one thought I, I realised I forgot to mention and yeah. it's very important. Like we do all this, um, it is actually to create a very nice home for the microbes. Mm. Um, one thing that we have in our Project Black Go syllabus is that compost is not just nutrients and not just organic matter. It is also a lot of living microbes that is really, really good for your soil and your plants. And when we do this power, when we do all this flipping, it's actually to create a very nice home for them. Wow. All right. Now, why don't you share with us your personal tip on how we can manage our composting at home? Yeah. So at home, um, you don't have space like the garden. Um, you would normally need a container. So a container that is a pail or a pot, um, it's great. Um, and you can, some people do con, uh, make compost in much smaller containers as well. But I think if you want to do this kue uh, lapis method, that, <laughs> as I call it, uh, it's good to have a bigger volume. And then you can stack two pails together. Your inner pail needs to have holes because as your foot scraps, uh, they start to decompose, they break down, they would lose water. And you, this home for the microbes, it should not have too much water, so you need holes to drain out the water. The water, you can you know, use it to water your plants, or you can just uh, uh, pour them away if you don't want them. Um, but essentially, um, when you do your kue lapis, the top layer of your pao is always brown layer. Um, it would have a thicker layer on top so that your foot scrap um, is never exposed. Mm. So that uh, when, when your foot scrap is not exposed, um, I think just now Wilson mentioned, sometimes your you know, flies and others, they might come, they might be attracted or they might start to smell. But when you do composting right, your pail, your pots should never smell. Mm -hmm. In fact, they should smell good. Um, and if you want to, you can cover up the pot with a cloth or cardboard. Mm. Yeah. And then you just put it um, in your balcony or in your corridor. Right, so those are really great tips because I wouldn't have imagined to put the last layer as brown. I thought just, just layer, la, you know what I mean? But to have the last layer there so that you prevent the fruit flies and the pests like Dr. Wilson was mentioning before, those are really, really good tips. So mm. thank you very much for sharing us with that. Now, talking about it, if I cannot do composting at home, but I want to contribute my efforts still, how can I do so to the Jurong Lakes Gardens Community Composting Initiative? Jeremy? Sure. So if you'd like to join us for a community composting initiative, you can email us at jurongleggardens at mparks.gov.sg. So uh, unfortunately, because of the current COVID-19 situation, our on-site programs are currently suspended. Mm. But you can still contribute and support our compost maker by bringing down your food scraps every Tuesday and Friday evenings because they work on the compost pile every Wednesday and Saturday mornings. Mm. Wow, okay, Wednesdays and Saturday mornings. So, on the weekends, you're also working. Yes. Thank you very much for working on the weekends and turning our Singapore into much more sustainable for our environment as well. That's really amazing what you guys do. So, that's it. I would like to thank L.Y., Tui Fen and Jeremy for joining us and also to share all this wonderful community composting initiative and Project Black Go with us today. Now, with that said, hearing about the composting initiative at Jurong Lake Gardens has gotten me interested to try composting at home as well. If you'd like to have more video resources on composting, such as how to make a simple DIY Bokashi composting, check out our Sustainable Fest 2021 playlist on the NPARKS SG YouTube page. Now, for those of you who frequent the gardens, you will know that the Lakeside Garden at Jurong Lake Gardens was developed around the theme of nature, play, and the community. 
with its wonderful and waterfront location and nature-sensitive design, visitors here will also be able to have an opportunity to get close to nature here. It is also a popular place for bird watching and to spot biodiversity. Now, let's join Jeremy and Casey, a volunteer at Jurong Lake Gardens, as they introduce to you some of our feathered residents and where you can spot them at the gardens. Hello everyone, I'm Jeremy, and with me is Casey, a volunteer at the Jurong Lake Gardens and an avid bird photographer. Hello everybody. Today, let us take you around Lakeside Garden of Jurong Lake Gardens to look out for some of the birds that you can see here. Jurong Lake Gardens is the first national garden located in the heartland. It is a people's garden where families and the community can come together. Lakeside Garden a 53-hectare garden centred around the theme of nature, play and the community is the first phase of the gardens to be completed. The garden is also home to lots of biodiversity, including more than 170 bird species recorded here. So Casey, where are we headed to first? Let's go to the Eco Pond at the Kusia Cove. Let's go! Here we are at Kusia Cove a 3-hectare closed-loop water system where water from the play area is filtered by plants in the eco-ponds and treated before cycling back into the play area. Jeremy, do you see there's a bird on the water edge there? Yes, I see it. It's a striated heron, right? Yes, it is. This bird has a habit of putting bait into the water to attract its prey. Let's take a picture of it. So Casey, what is it about bird watching and photography that you enjoy so much? Bird watching and photography allow me to better understand nature and the natural world. Understanding their behaviours allow me to appreciate and photograph them better. I can also share this knowledge with friends and people online and during guided walks in the gardens. Shall we head to Forest Ramble to see what else we can spot next? Yeah, let's go. Forest Ramble is a playground inspired by nature with 13 different adventure stations inspired by our native fauna. The play features here have been designed to enable children to mimic the natural movements of these animals. The nearby lake and natural wooded look of the play garden also allow for encounters with many of our feathered friends. I spot an oriental magpie robin. Do you see it over there? Let me take a look. They have really melodious call and are also a very popular pet bird species. However, poaching together with competition from other birds such as the Javan miners, led to a significant decline in their population numbers during the 80s and the 90s. Their numbers have slowly recovered and they are now regularly seen in many of our parks and gardens. At the southern end of the gardens, the meandering boardwalk at Rasa Walk is a restored wetland that brings you up close to the water's edge. Here, you can see some of the freshwater swamp forest plant species, such as the Salak Palm, and the Nipah palm. Along the water's edge, you can spot water birds such as the white-breasted water hen. These birds have long legs and toes that allow them to forage among aquatic vegetation easily. They are generally shy and prefer to run for cover instead of flying away. The vegetation around the boardwalk is also a popular resting spot for birds such as the grey heron. The grey heron is the largest of the resident herons in Jurong Lake Gardens standing up to a metre in height. These herons nest together in colonies called heronries on tall trees such as the casuarina tree. Right next to Rasa Walk is one of my favourite scenic spots, the grasslands. And do you know that it is also a popular spot for bird watching and photography? Yes, I have seen many photographers around here and there are also dedicated bird hides for bird watching. Okay, let's go and take a look. The grass seeds at the grasslands are an important food source for some of the bird species found here. There are three bird hides located around the grassland for bird watching up close in a non-intrusive way. A grassland bird species that resides in the grassland is the lesser cuckoo. Unlike most cuckoo species, they build their own nests and they are usually seen sunning themselves on top of shrubs in the early morning or after periods of heavy rain. The grasslands is also home to the Zitting Sisticola. They make their nests here amongst the tall grasses, which is also why we should always keep to the trail when we are in the grasslands. 
We hope you have learned a bit more about the bird species of Lakeside Garden at Jurong Lake Gardens. Casey, thank you for joining me for a fulfilling day of bird watching and for sharing your knowledge with everyone. It's my pleasure. Thank you everyone for watching and we hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. And with that, we have come to the end of day one of the online edition of Sustainable Fest 2021. Join us tomorrow at 6pm on NPARK's Bus Facebook page for Arts at JLG, Notes of Nature. Prepare to be captivated by tunes inspired by nature with Ding Yi Music Company and marvel at the visual art masterpiece that will be created by Rizman Putra in response to this music. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us for the Jurong Lakes Garden Sustainable Fest 2021. We wish you a wonderful Saturday and goodbye.